Okay, thank you for that, gentlemen. All right, um, we're ready? Okay, uh, take your Bible. Let's turn to uh, Psalm 103. This, um, uh, this should be a short message, and um, uh, I hope it'll be a blessing to you. So can I, I'll just brevitize some things here, and just, you know, uh, for instance, let me, you know, as a veteran missionary, you know, if you, were, if you were a deputation missionary, you may not have yet had an experience in the field. And vet, deputation missionaries are always, always rare. They're going to conquer half the world when they get to their location. And that's just, you know, you're just fired up and ready to go. And it's good. To be honest, being a missionary is way harder than you could even imagine. And there's a lot of difficulties. But I'll be honest with you. The Christian life is not easy. You know, being a missionary, one of the problems is, is where you're at. You know, Thailand is... Is if you, you want to know where Thailand is at in the world, it's basically put your finger wherever you are and just go on the other side. It's, it's a 12-hour time difference, and a lot of times I think the difficulties are, are a matter of location and, um, and such. But regardless, your life, your Christian life, is not easy. And let's be honest, um, it's the greatest joy, certainly, but our life in this world is, 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 is plagued with problems and, and challenges and temptations and, you know, when you're a missionary, you've got to be able to deal with these things. You, you can't fake it on the mission field. You know? In, in America, we have a church culture. You can just come to church and you can sit down and you can sort of blend right in. When you're in the mission field, you've got to live. And so this is a message, I think, that it, it helped me on the field a lot. This last term was very difficult. We had a lot of challenges. I won't get into all the problems that we had. Lots of, if we were looking for an excuse not to return or just this last term was it. But in the midst of all of the trouble that we had, it's interesting that God brought this particular passage to me, and, and I, I memorized it, I meditated it, and I just saw some things that really helped me to understand. I'm not going to tell you anything new. I'll just tell you that. This is not a theological, you know, uh, like, you know, whoa, where is this? But it's something you already know, but I think it's a practical aspect that will be a blessing to you. Okay. Um, Psalm 103, and uh, let me just read a couple of verses here, and, um, uh, and uh, we've prayed. I, I think I'll just get right into it just to sort of watch the clock a bit. Psalm 103, verse 1, the psalmist says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Okay, my Bible there has a colon after the word benefits. Does yours? And that means the thought continues, and the list of benefits comes afterwards. So whenever you see the word who in verses 3, 4, 5, there's, there's, he's, he's giving you examples of some of those benefits, which if you were to bring to your soul and meditate in them and, and, and remember them, it would bring your soul to the place of blessing the Lord and being a happy Happy Christian. Okay, so let's let's get right into this here. Psalm 103. What do we find? What what do we find is happening in Psalm 103? Well, we find the writer of the psalm speaking to himself. Right. Um, he says, "Bless the Lord, O my soul." Who is he talking to? He's not talking to God. He's not talking to his buddies. He's talking to himself. He's talking to his soul. It's like me saying, "Hey, Mike, bless the Lord." Uh, he's telling his soul, by the way, what to do. Right? He's talking to himself, and he's telling himself or his soul what to do. He's telling his soul to bless or be happy in the Lord. So your soul, by the way, what is your soul? You know, you've, 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 you've got a body, and you've got a soul, you've got a spirit. Your body, that's the physical part of you, and that's how you interact with the physical world, right? If you didn't have a body, you're going to have some problems in this world, Right? <laughs> Okay, and your spirit, that's how you interact with the spiritual world. Without your spirit, you wouldn't be able to communicate with God. You couldn't actually understand him and the Holy Spirit speaking to you, and that's how you interact with the spiritual. But your soul, your soul is how you interact with people and situations. So your, your soul is comprised of your thoughts, your emotions, your feelings, and it's, it's how you interact with, with these things where even if you can't actually get a handle on how to interact with people and situations, it just makes everything really hard. And you're, you're able to process these things with your soul. So, so we find the writer here of the psalm speaking to himself. Let me just ask you, in your opinion, is that weird? Is that strange that he's speaking to himself? 
You know, if you were out in public and you were talking out loud to yourself, the people around you might think you're weird, okay? Um, and maybe it's inconsiderate. But I want to say here tonight to you and, and, and to myself as well um, that, that, that we should speak to our soul as to what it should do and think and maintain a state or a status of soul that's in line with truth. And if you don't, you know, I can tell you, if you didn't get a handle on that, what, that, that truth or that, that what the psalmist is portraying here and, 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 and offering us here, if you didn't, I could tell you what the status of your soul would be. It'd be like you releasing your soul to its surroundings. It, it'd be like, it'd be like um, you, you'd become like a ship without a rudder. That's basically what life is like when you just let your soul just loose. You know, wherever the, wherever the, if you were a ship without a rudder, wherever the, the current is, is flowing, you're going to go that direction. Wherever the wind blows, you're going to have to go that direction. And so, um, let me just say, God never intended... The state of your soul, your thoughts, emotions, your feelings, how you interact with people and situations to depend on people and how they treat you. But a lot of times that's, that's how we live our lives. God never intended the state of your soul to depend on circumstances and what's happening around you. But God intended the state of your soul to depend on Him. Amen? And you and I doing our job to bring a truth to our soul and allow it to be in the state or status it ought to be in. Um, so, in, in, in essence, here, here's the application for this message. It's very simple. You and I, we should have some Holy Spirit-led discipline in controlling our thoughts, our emotions, our feelings, our soul. And it speak to your soul. We should be telling it, not it telling us. You know? Uh, and, and so, you know, let me just say, if you didn't do what, what, what we're saying here and what this lesson, I think, would, would, would show us, I can sort of paint a picture of what your life would look like. Just, we'll just throw some things out here. And this is what life would look like. If you, if you didn't actually um, get a handle on this, this truth in this application, right? So here's what your life would look like. Let's, I'll just throw some things out here. Um, stress, worry, doubts, fears. And we could keep going in where it becomes sleeplessness and headaches and affects our physical life and things like that. And none of these things are God's way of managing our life. God never intended your life to be managed by having stress and worry and fear and doubts, and we could keep going on. I mean, none of those things are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Right? right? What is the fruit of the Holy Spirit begins with love and joy and peace, and we, we could keep going here. Um, nowhere in the fruit of the Holy Spirit do we read st stress and worry and fear. I know, though, sometimes we feel sorry for ourselves. Sometimes we have something going on in our life, or we have a person who's challenging us in our life, and we may feel sorry for ourselves or defend our current state of soul that is stress and worry and fear. And that's, generally, that's how we would, we would operate. But can I just challenge you tonight? It's not God's plan for our life. It's not God's. And it's actually a hindrance both to your, to your, your walk with the Lord and your fruit bearing while you're in this world. And so... You know, let's get right into the application. Let me just challenge you then. In this last week, or even today, what have you been doing for your soul? What have you been doing with your soul, I guess we could say? And you know, for many, if they were to be honest, the answer is probably nothing. And I don't mean that you're not reading your Bible or you're not, you're not coming to church. I just mean there's no real concentrated effort to check the soul and maintain the state of soul that God intended it to be in. And, and who should give an account for that? Who should give an account for your current state of soul? I mean, could I say, well, it's my wife's fault because um, she did something mean to me, and, and, or it's my husband's fault because he's, he's this, or, or it's the boss's fault, he's just not fair, or it's the accident, the car accident's fault. Who, who should give an account to the, for the current state of our soul? I'll tell you who. It's very clear. The Bible makes it very clear. I'll shoot this out to you. You can just write this reference down. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Here's what it says. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Keep thy soul, I'm sorry, keep thy heart. Keep thy heart with all diligence. Right? Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Remember I said your soul is how you interact then, not with the physical world, not with the spiritual world, but with people and situations, the issues of life. 
The issues of life don't rise and fall on how people treat you or what's going on and whether things are just smooth and steady. The issues of life depend on what you're doing with your soul. And so the Bible says clearly, keep, that's you, right? Keep your heart, keep your soul with all diligence. For out of it are the issues, not out of, out of, out of other people or other situations, out of what you're doing with your soul. That's how the issues of life are, are, are handled and dealt with. Uh, you're the keeper. You're like the zookeeper. And sometimes it's like a zoo. Amen? It's you, you're it. And so, um, believe me, the Holy Spirit's your partner, but you've got a part in this. It's not, you know what, this is good news. We're not victims. We're not victims of other people. We're not victims of circumstances. We're, not, we're victors. And this, this lesson actually gives you and I freedom to live. I mean, to have joy and to have peace and, 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 and not to be a victim of our own soul if we're not careful. And so the writer of the psalm, again, what does he want his soul to do? That he's, right now he's speaking to himself, his soul, and he's, he's, he's telling it. What's he telling it to do? One more time, verse 1. He says, um, bless the Lord, O my soul. He's saying, O oh, my soul, listen up, bless the Lord. Um, you know, can I just say, he's telling it. It wasn't, hey soul, how do you feel today? Who cares how we feel? It's not that we don't care how you feel. It's just that your life doesn't go forward based on, hey, hey soul, how do you feel? You feel okay? It, he's actually telling his soul, hey, hey soul, this is how we're going to feel because this is the truth. You see? Your soul is either going to be attached to the flesh that's, or it's going to be attached to the spirit. And you're the one who's going to pull the trigger on that. So he's telling his soul, hey soul, he's telling it. Bless the Lord. Be happy in the Lord. Hey, soul. Hey, thoughts. Hey, emotions. Hey, feelings. Hey, guys. Bless the Lord. Hey, soul. Rejoice in the Lord. Thank the Lord. Be satisfied in the Lord. He's setting up the status or the state of his soul. Now, I always like to say this here. I, I have to do that. I'm the kind of person, when I wake up in the morning, I feel bad. I don't ask to feel bad when I wake up. I just feel bad. I, when I wake up in the morning, I feel like somebody that just came back from the dead. Maybe I did, I don't know. But when I look in the mirror, it looks like it too. And so when I wake up, I, here's how I used to be. I wake up in the morning and, and I'd lay in bed and I'd start thinking about all the things I don't want to do that day. It's just, I just had the propensity just to think like that. And you know, when I got a hold of this passage and when God spoke to me, I said, hey, that's not how we start the day. And you know, at this point now, when I wake up in the morning, I still feel bad. But when I get up and I'm making my way to the bathroom, I'm already speaking to myself. Hey, soul, bless the Lord. I got one job today. We got one task. I'm not worried about that. I don't care about this or that person over there. I'm not worried. I got one job today, and that's to be happy in the Lord and bless the Lord. That's the direction we're going. And so I'm setting it up. I'm, I'm already making the decision. I agree. That's the path we're on. So, hey, soul, get on board here because that's where we're going. So um, I like what the writer of the psalm says. Uh, he says, in verse 1, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Well, he said, Brother Lima, you don't know what's going on in me. You don't know this and this. And, you know, actually here, it's all inclusive. <laughs> Good news. You know, all that's within me, bless his holy name. He's going to control everything that's within in blessing the Lord. That's in every situation, with every mood, and every feeling, everything coming together to accomplish this one task today. You got one job, Christian. You got one job. God saved you to do one thing, to know him and to rejoice in him. Amen. Amen. Um, I used to get wrapped up in all the other things as if I was God. I'm not God. I, I used to have this thing on my wall. I don't know why I ever took it down. I loved it. But it, it said this very simple phrase. It said, there's two things I've learned in life. One, there is a God. Two, I'm not him. <laughs> simple. Um, so so it, it's interesting to me here. Now, let me just, let me just encourage you. How do you know what's going on in your soul? Like if you were just as a husband and wife, now my wife and I, we both got a hold of this, this passage and I shared it with her and, and uh, you know, she, she saw it. And, and, and so how do me and her know what's going on in, 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 I, I, in her soul and what she knows what's going on in my soul? How do you know? You know, do you just open it up and you show people or you know, what is it? Or light that goes off? What is it? Well, what is it that, that, that um, our Lord said that, um, I'm trying to think of what, what, uh, 
It's not that which goes into man that defiles man, but what comes out of man. So what is it that comes out of man that defiles man? What is it that justifies you and condemns you? Do you know? It's your words. Your words. Your words. If Jesus said, for your, every word that comes, proceeds out of the mouth of man, he'll be brought into judgment. In other words, your words that reflect what's going on in your soul. Your, your words just don't pop out. They come from somewhere. They, they come from a heart, a soul. And so, if you ever want to know what's happening in your soul, just look at what words are pouring out of your mouth. So, here's a challenge. Say, say, say you know, everybody's had this experience. Say you're, you want to hammer something, you're going to hold that thing, and when you go take that hammer to hammer that nail or whatever, what do you end up doing? You're not like me? You smash your thumb. And when you smash your thumb, what do you say? Don't say anything bad. What do you say? Other than ouch. You know, we, we Christians, we don't use bad words. When I, I got saved when I was 20, and I would not tell you what I would say. I would, I would curse that hammer. With a, you know, that's, just, that's, how, that's how the unsaved, unre, you know, generate man thinks. Well, as Christians, no, we don't use those bad words. We, we've changed the rated G words. We're going to darn the hammer. I don't know why we do that. Hammer, I darn thee. You know, we're just going to curse the hammer. As if it's, you know, why do we do that? I, mean, just, I know, and you're laughing, and we're, well, why do we do that? Do you know, as much as we think it's innocent to darn the hammer, the truth of the matter is, it's reflecting what our soul's reaction to that incident is. I mean, if you cussed it with a bad word, or you cussed it with a rated G word, what's the difference? It's still showing what your soul's reaction is to that thing. I know you think it's crazy, but just imagine, you smash your, your thumb with a hammer, and instead of darning the hammer, you just go ahead and say, praise the Lord. I know, you, it's crazy, right? Is it? I mean, what if you did? Do you know it totally changes your reaction to something? I'm, I'm serious. You watch, your words will re- lead your, your life. I mean, that's why, you know, I was looking at my wife and husband. You ought to tell your wife every day, I love you, honey. Why? Because your, your words lead you. Your words, when you confess Christ as Savior, how important is that? Because your words actually reveal the truth that you've accepted something. So what if you just praise the Lord when something bad happens? I'm serious, too. But we don't do that. We're, we're too busy darning the thing and trying to pray the thing down to actually receive something that God puts in our life and accept it with thanksgiving and praise. And our soul is struggling. It's just not on board. And, and, and this is a struggle. Uh, I'll give you an example. My wife and I, I was telling Pastor, we stay in a travel trailer when we're in the States. Uh, we sold our home back when we, were, when we left for the field and bought a truck and got a little, little camper and... And so we've always done that. So one time we were in, this is recently now, you know, since we've, we've learned this together, and it was a, it, God does this to try and give you experience, amen? That's, that's experiencing the grace of God. So we're in the woods somewhere, and the wind's blowing, I mean, crazy. And sure enough, you can see it when you pull into this campground, the trees are going like this. This is in Wisconsin. And uh, my wife, like every good wife, she looks up, she says, one of these trees is going to fall on us. And I'm always like, honey, don't prophesy. You don't know that. <laughs> so, like every good husband, I'm like, no, it's not going to happen. Come on. And the next morning, you know, we slept through it. And then the next morning we get up and, and we're just getting going. We didn't even say hello yet. And you could hear the wind blowing through the trees. And next thing you know, boom, a chunk of tree falls out of the sky and smashes our trailer. Yeah. And, okay, so this all happened quick. But let me give you the, the slow motion part of it. I was getting ready to darn the tree. Darn tree? Yeah, I was just getting ready to... I didn't say it, though. It did not come out. My countenance must have said it, and my wife, she looks at me, and we had, we had just been learning this and, and studying it together and talking about it and getting ready to apply it, and she looks at me, she says, she says, well, let's thank God for that tree. And, you know, and I was like, yeah, okay, that's crazy, but I was like... And then I didn't say all this. I'm just processing it, and I'm just telling you how it went, and I'm like, she's right. She's absolutely right. And we literally, we prayed. We said, God, we, we bowed our heads. We said, God, you love us. You always love us. You died for our sins and we're alive today in you. You'll never fail or forsake us. Thank you for that tree, Lord. We don't know what the purpose is, but whatever purpose you have accomplished it, thank you for the tree. In Jesus' name, amen. We said, amen. That tree just floated back up into the sky. It reattached itself to that tree. And no, nope, didn't happen. I'm joking. Uh, nothing changed. The tree was still there, and the trailer was still, you know, and the, hit the truck and it had a scrape. In the, that, none of that changed. What changed was our attitude. Uh, there was no need to darn the tree. She didn't say, I told you so, and I said, you didn't tell me. And we didn't have to argue. There was none of that. 
we seriously, we were happy in the Lord. I mean, there was still the, the heaviness of having to deal with the situation, but we were really happy in the Lord. We maintained that state of soul. We didn't let the, the, the status or our soul go with the tree. We, we had to go with the Lord. You know? But so, crazy things. By the way, you already know this. You already, this is nothing new. Romans 8.28. I don't know. Most Christians know Romans 28, 8.28, right? What's it say? And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So what does that mean to you? Number one, let me just say, it doesn't mean that everything works for good in your life. It, there's a condition there. The condition is what? Everything works for good in those people who love God. Now you say, well, I love God. Do you? Do I? When the tree smashes your trailer, do you really love God? Or are you going to darn the tree? I'm just saying, your reaction to everything in life makes it that you show you love God, and then he makes that work for good. Let's just say it again. And we know that all things work together for good to them that bless the Lord. Right? How do you love God? Would you not love God by, uh, um, I, bless, you know, I bless the Lord at all times, his praise should continue to be in my mouth. He loves me and I love him all the time. I'm just saying, in that situation in life where you get the bad news or that difficulty comes in or whatever the case, what if you were to just say, thank you, God, for this thing. I bless you, Lord. Would you not be showing God do you love him in that thing? When Jesus had to face the cross, did he not love the Father and love you and me and, and just take that? And did it not turn into something good? And that's the promise. Um, by the way, you say, well, Brother Lehman, that's so extreme. Is it extreme? We say, it, it all works for good to them that love God. Though those who are the called according to his purpose. Well, what is God's purpose for your life? Why did God save you? You say, well, Brother Lehman, he called you to be a missionary. That's his will for your life and his will for my life. No, no, that's all secondary. What is God's really, his, what is his will for your life? Do you know it? Oh, here's another reference. Just shoot this out to you. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. What's it say? In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What is God's will for your life? That in everything, you would give thanks. You bring it in. You bring it into God's will. We're so busy trying to wrestle everything to the ground. We're so busy trying to wrestle God in prayer to try and get him to do what we want him to do and, and, and whatnot, that we don't actually just say, stop and say, hey, God, thank you for this situation. Thank you for this person who's been a challenge. Thank you for this, Lord. I accept this, Lord. And I pray that you would change it if it be your will. And if not, I thank you for it. You love me, Lord, and in this thing, I love you. That's God's will for your life. Can you do that? Could you believe that the Jesus Christ who loved you when he went to the cross, died for your sins, and then rose from the dead so you could be alive today, could you believe that he loves you also in this moment that you're struggling with that thing? That's, that's, that's what he's... That's, that's what he's looking for. God has one purpose in your life, that you would know him and rejoice in him and in his love, in everything. So, you know, if you get all that, um, you need a method to really apply it in just a, in a moment by moment, maybe an everyday basis. And, and I, I really think God doesn't want us just to bless the Lord, just to say, bless the Lord, or just, you know, sometimes it becomes it's just a saying, or praise the Lord, just to say it. But there should be a foundation for it. And I think God gives us the manner or the method in verse 2. That's, that's sort of what I saw there. He says again, bless the Lord, O my soul. So how do I make it to do that? How, how, what's the method? It says it in the rest of that verse 2. It says, and forget not all his benefits. What's that mean? Well, forget not means remember. Right? So it sort of works like this. You forget an accident. You remember on purpose. Remember how you're supposed to keep your soul with what? With all diligence, right? And so it takes some diligence here to remember, recall, or, or not forget all of God's benefits, all of his goodness, all of the truth, all that he is to you. You and me need to be good at bringing it up, bringing it to our, our recollect, bringing it to our mind, bringing it to our thoughts, and parking it there. What do we call that? What do you call that? Do you know what you call that? It starts with an M. It's all over the Bible. It's in the Old Testament. It's meditation. It's oh, good old-fashioned Bible meditation. By the way, you're already good at meditation. You're, it's the problem is with, that we, we tend to meditate on the wrong things. 
And so instead of meditating, we end up medicating. Am I right? You know that person said something that was mean and hurt your feelings, and what do you do? You just think, 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 think about how terrible they were and how mean they were and how it hurt your feelings. You're awake at night thinking about it. Or you're busy th- trying to be God and solve a problem that he never intended you to solve. And we're meditating on meditating. Man, it's like this never ending. When we all along, God, God wants you and I to bring that thing to him in prayer. That's Philippians 4, 6, with thanksgiving. And that means meditating no longer on that problem. Changing your mind and meditating on God's goodness and his promises and who he is to you. Yeah, I'm just saying, the gospel, hey, you love the gospel. The gospel saved you, gave you a home in heaven. But the gospel's for living. It's not for, for, for dying. It's for being now. You're already alive, amen? And so, you know, the gospel is for, for this situation here too. And so your meditation needs to come back to what it ought to be. And by the way, that's why he gives you some examples. Verse 3, 4, 5, there's some examples right there. Just you meditate, you think about it. God, who forgiveth all thine iniquities. You just park it there for a while. And that'll change your, 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 your status here of your outlook. And, I mean, there's all, there's all sorts here. I mean, I'm not going to go into them all right there. But um, this, is, this is really the, the forgotten art of the Christian life. I think. I think it is. I think it is. We have our devotions. You, read your, you should read your Bible every day. Can I just say, you, as a Christian, you, you have a couple of duties. Be in church when church is gathering. And, you know, and then read your Bible. You should read your Bible every day. But a lot of times we read our Bible in the morning. It's just... And you get done, you're like, I, yeah, it didn't, didn't really speak to me. And it's just letters on paper. That, yeah, and it's necessary for you to read, but that's not what we're talking about right here. And you have a prayer list, and you should have a prayer. You should intercede for people, but a lot of times we're just praying for people's problems, praying for people's problems, and that stresses you out even more. And that's good, you should, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about taking a Bible truth, in a, as a verse, or just a passage, and bringing it to your your mind, your thoughts, your soul, and parking it there until, it, until the Holy Spirit reveals those truths to you. That's, that's when you, that's why, Joshua 1, eight. this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. That's meditation. That's literally muttering. That's meditation. That's taking this book, a passage, and muttering it back to yourself. Instead of muttering about the problems you have all the time, is that not what we do? God intended you and I to mutter the truths of God's love to our soul until it affects our state and our outlook and our response. And so, that's, that's Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt medit- not medicate. Meditate therein day and night. Right? Um, um, and, what, and what happens when you do that? You'll have good success. And you'll prosper. Right? And so, so, you know, let me just challenge you here. I, when I saw that, I said three things to myself. I can remember going through this, and, I, and it was just like this, this time for me to sort of, sort of, you know, as we get ready, we're going to a new city, and uh, we had to get through a lot of troubles at that point. And I remember just being honest with God and saying, you know, <laughs> I can't continue in the current state of soul that I had just been struggling with. And when I saw this, I, I, I came to three conclusions. Number one, I came to this conclusion, and you could just take it or leave whatever, you know, you want to apply, but number one, I said, God, this is sin. Have you ever considered that worry, stress, and fear, and doubt, that is actually sin? Now, we we all deal with it, but to dwell in it is another matter. And I mean, I was an expert warrior. Not warrior, warrior. (laughs) Um, And so, you know, what's the first and great command? Real quick, I'll probably be done here in just a few minutes. First great command, what is it? That you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. That's the same thing. With all your, in one passage it says your thoughts. You know, that's just what we were saying, your soul. It comprised what your, your mood, your feeling, your thoughts. And, I, you know, I haven't loved you, Lord, with all of my thoughts, with all of my soul, with all of my heart. And so, by the way, if you say, well, Brother Lehman, that's so extreme. Is it extreme? If I'm, if I'm guilty of, of the first and great command, that means I'm guilty of the first and great sin. 
And so, you know, I just was honest. I said, God, I haven't given this attention. I haven't kept my heart with all diligence. And, and you know, um, I, want, I want to just say, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I think I failed you and my own soul in many ways. I'm not just, this is just a matter of your daily walk. I think that's something that I had to, like, like level with. Number two, I understand this. Um, this takes, remember, keep thy heart with all diligence. You know what another word for that is? Discipline. How many of you just have a boatload of discipline just laying around the house? You're going to pick it up, you get right to it. Discipline's just not in us. So where do you get love and joy and peace? Where do you get it? It's the Holy Spirit. So where do you get discipline from? The same place. I just said, God, I don't have the discipline to actually apply this in the way I should, but I pray that you just give me the Holy Spirit-led discipline in this area. And will he, will he do that for you? Oh, yes. And so and the third thing was, you know, you have a plan. We always have a plan for important things. How many of you ate something today? Unless you're fasting, you know, we all ate, we all ate food, right? Okay, five people ate something today. I'm joking. Um, you know, how often do we eat? Or uh, how often should we eat? Three times a day, right? You know, there's a psalm. It says, Psalm 55, 17 says, Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud. You know the word pray? It comes from a Hebrew word that has this meaning. To ponder, speak to oneself, or meditate. I'm serious too. It's like God wants us to actually stop three times a day. And I'm not saying you have to, and this is not a religion, but just think about taking a break maybe a couple times a day. I do it in the morning. I already told you that in the morning, I'm already having a conversation on the way to the bathroom. Hey, Mike, I got one job today. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. And I usually bring some truth to my soul at that moment that actually has a foundation for that. At noon, I always have a gospel Bible verse. I'm always memorizing and meditating on to keep me fresh, to keep my mind where it needs to be. I bring the gospel, I, bring, I apply the gospel both to my salvation and, and that thing, that problem, that person. Amen? I died with Jesus so that I can live. And so I want to live. And so it's always a gospel meditation I have at noon. And at night, just to wrap things up here, I'm sorry, I've gone probably further than I should, but, um, you know, at night, my wife and I always joke about this because I was uh, one of those things where my wife and I are going to bed I, we've been together all day long. And, um, you know, sometimes wives just like to wait until the last moment of the day to tell us about all of the problems in the world and ask us, what are you going to do about it? And so my meditation going to sleep is, you know, what am I going to do about that? I don't know. And so my wife and I just came to the conclusion, you know, we, have, we found this saying somewhere, his word, last word. And my wife and I, we get in this habit now and she comes to bed and um, I think recently you asked me, why is it cold? Why is it hot? And, and I was like, let's, let's just settle on this. And I, I quote to her, I always have a, a psalm that I'm memorizing. You know, you memorize to do what? You memorize in order to meditate. That's the point of med- memorizing. We never memorize to say, good job, Mike. You memorized another one. You always memorize to meditate. So I always give her my memorization. I always, I always quote it to her. And she has one and she quotes it to me. That's sort of like the last thing we do. It's sort of like morning, noon, and night. I'm just saying... We should have control. God's given us this privilege. This is freedom. And we're free. Christians, we are free to enjoy this world, our relationship to God, and our relationship to people and situations. Everything doesn't have to go right. Right? What is right? That Jesus died and rose from the dead. That's what makes things right. Not everything's perfect. Not every people around us, they're not all perfect. They're just like you and me. But we can actually thrive. Amen? We can actually experience peace and joy and love and all of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, but you've got a big part of it. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it, what you do with it, what you're doing there with it, get a plan, because what you do with that, that's the issues of life. Amen? Okay, well, that's encouraged me as a missionary, and I'll just leave that with you, Pastor, and I'll just pray, and then you can close here, however you see fit. Our Father, thank you, God, for uh, this great salvation that you've given us Oh, Holy Spirit, thank you for giving us your life. You live in us, and you've allowed us to just uh, thrive, Lord, in our relationship to you, and even with problems and people and things. Thank you, God, for the victory we have in you. Lord, help us to be victors, not victims. And help us, Lord, to keep our heart with all diligence. Give us a plan. Give us a reminder. Holy Spirit, bring this truth to our minds frequently that it become a habit and a part of our lives. Lord, we just want to commit this to you. Perhaps there's some struggling as as I, as a missionary was. Lord, I pray that you give them just the solid foundation, understanding to get a victory and just to, to, to be a Christian of joy and peace 
And Lord, we thank you for what you'll do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.